Uh, hold on. Before we start tonight's episode, let me get a sip of some ice water. Mm. Mm. Thank goodness for the refrigerator plant. You know what I mean? Because without it, pff, humans probably never would have had ice. Oh, wait. You mean to tell me that ice was like a luxury good for most of human existence? Sucks, dude. The history of shitty living where ice is a luxury. Tonight on Deep Fat Fried. Deep Fat Fried! Yeah, that's true. Ice is taken for granted. And, you know, like, we love ice more in this country than a lot of other countries love ice, you know? They make fun of us for it, man. They're like, you Americans like, love you ice. You Americans, you fucking ice. It's like, fuck you, bitch. Ice is We good. gotta have ice. We gotta have our fucking ice, dude. A, a beverage is always crisper with ice. Because mm. you know what ice does? It brings it down to that temperature where it's almost <sighs> freezing cold, but not quite. We want to drink our drinks at maximum coldness, all right? True. I don't know what it is with you guys. You want to drink that nasty room temperature bullshit. <sighs> Fucking wrong with those people. And then in those, a lot of these countries, if you ask for ice, they give you like a cube, and it's like that ain't enough, bitch. Yeah, fill that whole glass with ice, man. Rip me off. Put so much ice in it that I barely get any soda. Yeah, that's, that's what you're the, supposed to do. That's the American way, baby. <laughs> yeah, the American Damn way. We load that shit down with ice to the point where you can't even fucking barely fit the drink in there. Like you pour that drink out, it'd probably be fucking a thimble full or something. But so like, you know what? Dude, it's a nice cold beverage, though. Yeah, but it's nice and cold. It is frosty. So ice, as I said in the intro, was at one point a rare treat for only the very wealthy. For I mean, in fact, for the bulk of human history, if you look at the totality of it, its creation was through purely natural means. Uh, Indian and Egyptian cultures used rapid evaporation to cool water quickly, sometimes quickly enough to make ice, depending on the weather outside of the building. But they were never able to, like, perfect the mass manufacture of it. Um, Iran developed a yakchal, which is Persian for ice pit. Uh, which were onion-shaped buildings up to two stories tall, one pictured here, uh, with an equal amount of space underground. So they're kind of like a... You only see half of it, but it's shaped like a big beat, I guess. Um, And the conical structures allowed uh, ice to be made and collected during the colder months and then used throughout the year for things like preserving food and making falude, which is a traditional uh, frozen dessert. In Persia, I guess, made with thin noodles and semi-frozen syrup. Man, look at the look at the fucking insane amount of trouble they had to go through to make fucking ice, though. Yeah, the, I mean, this is like the first fridge, and it was a big community fridge that you had to share with everybody, and probably was doled out only to people who could afford it. You know what I mean? Right, because they're not just like need. freely giving this shit no. out. Like, here's have some ice. Oh, no. you need some ice for your Hell drink. No, have some ice. You have ice guards and shit, dude. Otherwise, you know, some it's asshole's like, gonna go in the middle of the night s- and take a bunch of ice. You get some ice. It's like put your meat in the ice pit. It becomes communal meat the minute you do, but it will be preserved. It's like okay, thanks. So, or you uh, can use the same ice that you're using to preserve meat to make a delicious sundae. I mean, hey, or just rinse it off, man. Just rinse off yeah. the blood, bro. What do you say? Why you gotta be such a pussy, man? Are you a Persian or are you an American? I guess I'm an American. I don't know. Oh, man. Uh, So I was actually kind of like, how does this thing make ice, though? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, So it's all about physics, I guess. Once water is stored inside of the Yakshal, it's able to freeze into ice because of extremely low temperatures that the structure creates. The hole in the center allows cold air to enter and make make its way all the way down to the subterranean bottom where the water is stored. The cone-like structure is also designed to make any hot air present inside the Yakshal make its way out. So I guess it's just like designed to trap cold air and funnel hot air constantly, I guess. Right. So something about its shape just does that. Which, right. Like how the fuck does like, how the fuck do primitive people even figure uh, that shit out? You got me. Primitive dude. people, TJ. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Um, no, I don't. TJ. Oh my God. A lot of it has to do with the special insulation that they use, and it's this weird uh, combination of sand, clay, and goat hair uh, that what? ensure the inside of the Yakshal remains way cooler than ice. Uh, so it's insulated. Or, or way cooler than outside temperatures. Yeah, so it's super insulated and super efficient at processing the air, so much so that it just remains like super cold inside. Um, these materials also make the structure impermeable. So it's very strong, I guess. I mean, I, I'm sure it's not impermeable, but it's it's. Well, how do they even get the fucking ice out then? <laughs> well, I, I mean, know. they go they go down the hole and they have somebody chalk out some ice or put some stuff down there or whatever. Oh, store shit. it. 
Um, that the hole is too small to even fucking fit somebody. Well, maybe they open it up a little bit and throw some unlucky bastard down there to do it. Um, Get in there. You have to live in the ice hole. Many of these monuments to the ancient uh, Persians uh, and their ingenuity are still around today. Hundreds of years later, uh, ice pits led the way to rudimentary ice houses recorded in China as early as the 7th century. Um, centuries later, wealthy Romans and Greek filled ice houses with snow and ice that was imported. Um, in this case, all the way from the Alps. So they would send some poor bastard on a mission, take a big cart. As soon as you get to the Alps, get way up in the Alps and get super clean snow and then ride as fast as you can back to Rome because you better get here before that shit melts. Cause the emperor wants a, wants a bunch of ice tonight. And wow. then tomorrow, do the same fucking thing, too. There's just like an endless train of people that are constantly go- going back and forth, getting ice for the wealthy. Um, the ice was then sold in what were called snow shops, where ice and snow could be purchased by average people. Um, so they had like little slushies, I guess, that they <coughs> let the excess snow that the emperor didn't need for his party or whatever go to the plebs. They throw some strawberries on it or whatever, and people would be like, ah. Oh! What Give snow? us a shilling, and we you shall get some snow. <laughs> yeah, we'll sell, we'll sell you some fucking water, man. It, yeah, man, I'm so glad we live in times where they don't do that shit anymore. Sell yeah. people yeah. water. I mean, fucking come on. ridiculous. Um. So yeah. Um. The uh, practice of putting ice in drinks for the enjoyment uh, uh, in the Western world dates back to the Roman Emperor Nero, who drank iced refreshments laced with honey constantly. Apparently, according to historians. Chilled drinks were also a part of the Tang Dynasty in China and the early Islamic world. Uh, in India, Mughal emperors drank kulfi, a drink made from condensed milk that was frozen into molds, which, you know, you needed ice making capability to even have. Um, this drink was made possible by mixing ice with the salt, lowering the freezing point below that of water, which you do now if you make ice cream. If you ever made ice cream in one of those little machines that, some of them, my, my mom used to have one you had to crank, but uh, the new ones, you turn on a little motor and it just like keeps moving the cream around and uh, you have to add salt to it. Um, cool. So they were doing that way back in the day. In the 16th century, it was uh, the Italians who brought back the use of ice. France, borrowing the tradition from Italy, was the first country to bring ice back, but as an extravagance. Henry the Third, and and those bastards are probably the ones that give you the most shit about ice too in Europe too, I know, right? Uh, fucking bastards, almost certainly. They're the ones who brought it back. Yep. So Henry the Third displayed heaps of ice and snow on tables when he had guests, just to like delight them. Like, ha ha! But you didn't think you'd have ice and snow today. <laughs> um, the rest of Europe scoffed at the use of ice to cool drinks, seeing it as a mark of excessive and effeminate luxury. They uh, they went from scolding to partaking, adding ice to every drink that they could. Of course they did, because the second it was just sour grapes bullshit. Yeah, it was excessive and effeminate. Uh, ice is now commonly available to you as Give well. Give it to me now! Give me that fucking ah! shit now, ah! bastard! Of course, dude. Refreshing. Even, like an icy, even the Roman emperors recognized all the way back then. It's like if you can have a drink that's hot or a drink that's icy, cold and refreshing. What are you going to choose? And yeah, like, choose. like so many ideas, uh, the French infected the early, uh, you know, brand new American government with this idea. And it continued. It got jumped over to the U.S. after the French started doing all this ice shit. Um, and Thomas Jefferson, he, he his gateway dealer was um, uh, Ben Franklin. He 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 went uh, on European travels with Ben, I guess, and 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 saw European ice houses, and then he had one built for himself. He encouraged George Washington, so it spread to the fucking president. And then pretty soon, you know, all the oligarchs were setting up ice houses over here, and the ice tyranny made its way to the United States as well. Damn. Um. So let's talk a little bit about the Ice King. Hell yeah. If something is rare and in demand, there's Thomas Jefferson, by the way. Good looking, good looking chap. Very strong nose. Oh, um, yeah. Or maybe this isn't Thomas Jefferson. Is this Thomas Jefferson? I don't think this is. No, this it is isn't. Maybe this is the Ice King. For the Ice King. So this yeah, is the that's right. This is the Ice King. Unless yeah, yeah, Thomas yeah. Jefferson is the Ice King. Maybe he maybe is. He was. It wasn't until uh, the 1800s that ice really took off as an easily accessible commercial enterprise. In 1805, two wealthy brothers from Boston. We're at a family picnic, enjoying the rare luxuries of cold beverages and ice cream. 
They mm. joked about how their chilled refreshments would be the envy of all the colonists sweating it out in the West Indies. It was a passing remark, but it stuck with one of the brothers. His name mm. was Frederick Tudor, and 30 years later, he would ship nearly 12,000 tons of ice halfway around the globe to become the Ice King. Wasn't an easy road to get there. His fellow Boston merchants, who were happy to speculate and everything from coffee to mahogany to umbrellas, thought that he was just playing nuts when he floated the idea of like, like hey, I'm going to go get some ice. And like, uh, what? <laughs> you okay. fucking idiot. It melts, bitch. When he invested $10,000 in 1806 and in, uh, then filled the good ship favorite with huge blocks of ice hacked from fresh, uh, a fresh pond in Cambridge, the Boston Gazette wrote, no joke, a vessel with a cargo of 80 tons of ice has cleared out from the port in Martinique. We hope this will not prove to be a slippery speculation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a frightfully witty droll comment from the Boston Gazette. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know that fucking like unfunny, stodgy assholes were, have always been around. You know, it's not a modern yes, they have. contrivance. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. I don't know. I kind of think it's funny. It, just, it, is, it, it, it is kind of like know. an ancient dad joke. Funny, I guess. It's just like an ancient rich asshole joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but like it, that kind of thing became the dad joke. It did. You're um, right. So anyway, it much a genealogical link for sure. For sure. Uh, much of the delight of his skeptics, his first trip turned out to be a financial disaster. While much of the <laughs> uh, ice uh, miraculously made it to Martinique, Tudor lacked uh, the infrastructure, namely a fucking cold place to put it and consumer education, like how to use ice because he's trying to sell it to people who have never had access to it never They're seen like, it before fuck is this yeah um so the ice melted away in six weeks and he ended up losing about four grand which i'm sure that's a lot in fucking yeah in 1806 yeah. bucks that's a lot of money yes yeah, they're watching your profits melt away uh the solution to insulation would uh prove to be sawdust creating an important aftermarket for new england sawmills um Further, it was difficult uh, to convince people to buy the ice. It was seen as a luxury item that might as well have been selling edible gold leaf. Like to these people, if they'd been exposed to it at all, it's just hearing about how like the leaders of countries and foreign countries, you know, have wine with ice in it or whatever. And they because they're so rich, they can pay somebody to go hack the ice and pack it into them. So they're trying to sell it to people and people are look at it as like a hyper luxury good. And so he had trouble convincing people that it was like real ice because, you know, he was actually selling it to them and not the governor or whatever. You too can have ice. It's like, no, I know I'm a pleb. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, He ended up giving a whole bunch of it away uh, to start generating actual demand, which is probably the smartest thing that he did with it. Um, that's, that's actually probably the, he made some hay out of uh, what was ultimately a failed venture this first time for the next 15 years. Uh, Frederick Tudor just continued though. He didn't give up. He learned from his mistakes and he shipped ice to ports from Charleston to Havana to new Orleans, building a trade, taking endless risk, suffering yellow fever, a mental breakdown, employee theft and government corruption. The Jefferson embargo, the war of 1812, the panic of 1819, finding himself perpetually undercapitalized and not once but twice tasting the humiliation of debtors prison so this dude <laughs> was fucking dedicated to get plebs yeah, like, some ice he man. believed in ice dude when he fucking had this ice idea he was just like all right ice yep and then like despite like numerous failures and hardships he's just like fucking nope ice bitch all in on ice i know it you've been to prison twice ice i'm the king of ice i'll never give it up yeah but what about this embargo Fuck it. How about some scarlet fever, bitch? Yes. I'll survive it. I'm sorry, yellow fever, not scarlet fever. Had a mental breakdown. Employees are stealing from him. Government's fucked up. Fucking everything is Two fucked. Two wars. Yeah. And I mean, embargo like, against ICE. Fucking I love how people, debtors people now prison. are like, oh my God, the world's crazy now. It's like, listen to this guy's life. The world's always been a crazy piece of shit. I mean, right? it gets worse. Let me just tell you a little more about his whole enterprise. Oh God. Uh, the right. whole operation was incredibly unsafe. <laughs> of course um, it was in addition Naturally. to those towering stacks of ice numb hands frostbite sharp sharp instruments frigid waters uh you know it's just like danger city to have people collect this and ship it <coughs> um 300 
pound blocks of ice could melt a little bit on the sli- uh, on the ship and start slipping and sliding around and fall on a dude. And uh, 300 pounds will fucking kill you if it falls from high enough height and you're going in, out down in the hold of these big ass wooden ships that are filled with it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, uh, it would knock people down. It would break their arms and legs and clavicles, TJ. Ugh. Um, ice harvesters often developed what was called ice man's knees, which were bruised and bloodied from days of shaving, uh, shoving solid ice. Oh, my God. Um, despite these drawbacks, Wyeth's ingenious methods were a major improvement on prior, uh, prior harvesting practice. Uh God. Tudor's reputation solidified in 1833 when he shipped 180 tons of ice halfway across the world to British colonists in Calcutta. The venture was so successful that it reopened trade routes between India and Boston. So he's starting to see some success at this point. Yeah. After pretty much years of being being like, he's crazy. He's a lunatic. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yep. Um, nearing the halfway point of the 19th century, frozen lakes were no longer the only means to produce blocks of ice in Mississippi. Dr. John, uh, Gorey invented the first ice machine in 1845. It's pictured here, uh, much like Frederick Tudor a few days before uh, a few decades before, uh, no one took the idea seriously. How come people always shorten short change in ice? They're like ice. It's not, it's not just ice, ice. Honestly, it's not just ice. People shortchange every idea that's great. They they really yeah. do. Like every idea that's great and profitable and new and that it ends up being world changing is poo pooed by everybody at the <laughs> beginning. A new idea? Pfft, yeah. Stupid. Uh, he was even able to make a successful prototype to show people that it could actually do this. Uh, but nobody was interested. They were just like, Poppycock, this is some sort of trickery, tomfoolery, and blah, blah, blah. Dr. John Gorey. Trying to make ice when nature already produces yes. it in abundance fool. each and every winter. Uh, yes. What Dr. A fool. John, Dr. John Gorey has created a machine that apparently does what you can accomplish by simply walking outside in November with your hand cupped to the heavens. <laughs> Um, I love fucking 1845 Thunderfoot, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 a great guy. Um, good to know he was out there. Um, Always been with us. So he was not able to fund the idea, and so the ice maker concept just got shelved for like decades. So like Americans Oof. could have had ice like for literal literal decades, but we saw it and nah. Nah. nah, nobody with money wanted to give this guy any money to manufacture them and sell them. So I don't see no promise in this. It's not like there's like historical would, precedent for people wanting this shit. Why would anybody want ice? It's cold. You don't need to have a, a warm drink is fine. It's just hard water. You can't even drink it because it's hard. Who wants that shit? No one. No usage. I mean, sure, it could be used to like preserve food and cool drinks and, you know, reduce swelling on wounds and other fucking numerous applications but who fucking wants it bitch I don't know, it nobody it mississippi too it's like mississippi you guys had something and what'd you do you threw it the fuck away dude so i actually say wait what would we want in the ass for around here dude, imagine if mississippi had said yes dude maybe right now mississippi is like the technological center of the u.s yeah right now. It you know mississippi been. this is why you guys the reason you guys are a fucking backwater shithole is because every time you fucking some genius is accidentally born in Mississippi, this is what you fucking do. We don't want your damn ass. Get out of town. Get out of here with your newfangled crazy ideas about the world. So in a pattern, what, that, if you're a genius, don't be born in fucking Mississippi. OK, yeah, don't be born in America. Just do yourself a favor. Um, uh, But definitely not Mississippi. Um, so, yeah, just like a whole lot of brilliant inventors, too, that he was kind of screwed out of uh, the glory and money that would have come with this great invention that he actually invented, because it wasn't long after uh, Andrew Mull to help. The, or Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, James Harrison, a British journalist, uh, invented the first practical vapor compression refrigeration system in 1856. Uh, Andrew Mull, to help the beef industry in Texas, picked up the idea and developed the first commercial ice machine in 1867. By the way, keep in mind, this is like decades, 1845 when he built this machine. So, yeah, it was like literally like, no, we're going to be in the dark ages for another 20 years. <laughs> we're not ready for ice cubes yet. You know, <laughs> like, wow. Um, so as soon as this happened, ice cream and cold beer became summertime staples. So it's almost just like Americans wanted to suffer through another 20 years without ice cream, cold beer in the summer, cold anything ever. You know, Sounds like America. 
Uh, dependable ice supply made it possible to get fresh meat, seafood, dairy product, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know what refrigeration yeah, enables. No one was interested in this guy's invention in 1845. No, not at all. The people, the business magnates of Mississippi looked at him up. I do declare this to be a worthless piece of shit. <laughs> yes. uh, a, a grifter. A total grifter, indeed. Um, <laughs> still, ice harvesting technology was pretty basic, although the principles of mechanical refrigeration were generally understood in Ben Franklin's day. Practical application was decades after Ben Franklin had died. Uh, what kept uh, harvested ice frozen was its sheer bulk. Um, the more that could be lightly packed together, the longer it stayed cold ice houses, uh, where stock could be stored year round had double outer walls, super insulated, separated by nothing but insulation like sawdust An opening in the top vented the latent heat, um, released by the melting, uh, water drained at the bottom, uh, to hasten, uh, or lest it hasten thawing. So if you let it sit in water, the water temperature it hastens the melt. So they would Try drain away anything that dripped on it. And you can keep the shit for a long ass time in an ice house that's properly insulated. So. Oh, yeah. Right. But it's like a lot of work. You got to make sure that, you know, it's uh, not being subject to the elements. You got to make sure the hot air is escaping. You got to make sure the cold, I mean, sorry, the, the warm water is draining away. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of shit you got to do. But uh, even with all those uh, precautions in the early days, the melt loss was huge. It was something like 90% of the harvest disappeared before it could be sold. Oof. Um, but, you know, over time, better transportation, notably railroads, reduced those losses. But even as of 1879, when the annual harvest was upward of 8 million tons of ice, about 3 million turned to water before it could be uh, ever be brought to market. So that's just Ooh. like, I mean, this the you your know, losses are incredible. Yeah. I mean, you have to understand that, like, there's not a lot of crazy people in the world that are as dedicated as, you know, that dude we covered, what whatever his name was, fucking uh, the well, crazy ice king. Luxury. Yeah, this is a true luxury. Frederick Tudor. I mean, yeah, if you're, you're going to lose almost half of it, just just transporting and getting it there and before you can even get it for sale, like the price of ice must have been pretty high. And of course, uh, with these buildings, too, you're at the mercy of, you know, extremely warm summers. If you have like an unseasonably warm summer, you get like what was called an ice famine. Where it's like people are like, oh, go down and get some ice. I and mean, they're like, oh, the ice houses are sold out of ice because it melted everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, oh, no. of course, um, this business, which has always been fraught with like risk, both physical and economic risk, and not a whole lot of upside because people were losing a lot of their hard work, um, it was doomed. Uh, so as soon as you know people started to be able to buy commercially available ice making machines, um, it was kind of over for this. Uh, so at the peak, uh, at the end of the 19th century, the U.S. ice trade employed an estimated 90,000 people. Uh, in an industry that capitalized at twenty eight million, which is more like six hundred and sixty uh, million dollar industry in twenty ten terms, I didn't really look up for twenty twenty one, but I'm sure it's sure. a few more million. Um, using ice houses capable of storing up to two hundred fifty thousand tons each, uh, Norway exported a million tons of ice a year, drawing on a network of artificial lakes that they built just to do that. Uh, competition had slowly been growing, however, in the form of artificially produced plant ice and mechanically chilled facilities, unreliable and expensive at first, ice began to be uh, successfully compete with natural ice in Australia and India during the 1850s and 1870s, respectively, until by the outbreak of World War I in 1914, more plant ice was being produced in the U.S. than naturally harvested ice, so... The days of cutting big blocks of this out of the lakes were over, and you can now make it in an ice house with a machine. Um, Ooh, a mint julep. Um, so the way that Americans used ice and cocktails drastically changed what we think of as a cocktail today. Um, you know, most liquor used to be served at room temperature, or even warm. Um, oftentimes, whiskey would be served warmed up. Um, and was thought of as, you know, that's something you're supposed to drink. And now, you know, ice like basically invented all the fruity cheerleader cocktails and shit. Um, so the way that America's, uh, use ice and cocktails, as I said, drastically changed them, not only the way we consume them, but the way that we made them, ice became a garnish. Part of the flair of the cocktail was how cold you could get it. Like just how cold can I get oh. this drink and serve it up? 
which yeah. is like, oh, you know, unthinkable before ice was widely available. Right. Um, there wasn't even a possibility of that. Yeah, the stupid motherfuckers in this country. They could have had this years and years before. And uh, it was over the top even for now. You think you get over iced now? Back in the day when this shit first came out, they would just fill your whole cup. Like, this is a mint julep. Yeah. And that whole cup is filled with ice, and then they just pour a little mint julep around it and put a sprig of mint in it and give you a straw to sip. There you, know. you go. Get so, your mint julep, bitch. Icy cold. Uh, the top of the frosty mountain that was put on every drink it would have a seasonal fruit, any seasonal fruit they could get their fucking hands on. Foreign travelers in the U.S. marveled at the wasteful way we flaunted our supply of clean ice. Fucking salty as always. Oh, look, they've got the clean ice and they put it on everything. How dare they flaunt this to us? Uh, <laughs> jealous you, little bitches, dude. Stupid frog bitch. Uh, compared to what Europeans expected, American water was, uh, at, at least at this time, extraordinarily clean. Yeah, because yeah. we didn't shit in our water. I mean, yep. my water sucks now, now, but back then it was fucking pristine. Yeah, we Before knew we, we knew not to shit up river, you know? Don't blame us for that. Um, when Congress passed the 18th Amendment, and shut down liquor stores on January 17th, 1920. The ice you had in your cocktail was far less important than just having a cocktail. Ice cubes increased in consumer popularity largely because of cocktails. But while the country dried out, citizens were finding it easier to get ice. Ice boxes and refrigerators were getting better at making ice. They were getting smaller. They were getting less uh, expensive. People were on the way, basically, at this time to having like something in their house, basically, that would make this. Um, so the bulk of what the country, uh, was still having huge chunks of ice delivered to their homes. Um, here's a picture of what that looked like, you know, just like milk, which I, you know, think is weird that people used to deliver milk. Yeah. Um, I used to deliver ice, you know, and you put in your ice. Yeah. yeah, There used to be an ice stuff on it. Yeah, and my they, mom told us about shit like this, like growing up, like people used, like used to use is like, yeah, our grandparents used to have ice boxes, but they actually put ice in and you're like, yep. what? And they and they deliver it. You can see they just throw it on the ground outside your house. And then I guess uh, I assume you would probably take it in and hose it off or wash it off a little bit and then throw it in your ice box and then chisel away at it. Um, the bulk of the country, like I said, was still having these huge chunks delivered, um, but a small growing percentage was able to get it in their home, um, especially with the switch to Freon as a coolant to the 1920s. Uh, Freon was much safer and easier. Uh, to manage the other gases, making in-home refrigerators an option. And thank goodness for that, because uh, Indiana Jones yeah, would have been dead in a fucking nuclear bomb if not for a wonderful old refrigerator, you know? Yeah, I mean, imagine if he'd only been if only you had that first refrigerator. Oh, he'd been dead. He'd been fucking dead. The new one, pretty much dead, but that one in the middle, yeah. that's right. That's the one you survive a nuclear blast in right there. Yep. Uh, so... When Prohibition ended, just over 1% of the country had a refrigerator, so it was not widely adopted by that time. But by just a few decades later, the mid-50s, uh, that number spiked to 80%. So it was just like an explosive industry. It became like a status symbol. Like, if you had a house, you better have a fucking fridge in it, and you were probably embarrassed if you didn't, you know what I mean? Not only that, but I mean, it's just such a useful tool because, you right. know, if you can keep food better, if you can pe- keep food good longer... Yeah. That's clearly a huge advantage. So, you know, and so that was it kind of the end of the history of a weird and long go along as you hear long ongoing trade, like a whole profession and a whole economy built around it that is just evaporated and is no longer a thing just made completely obsolete by technology. Well, I mean, that um, happens all the time. It still happens today to the point where you we take I mean? it like, for granted. You know what I mean? That, oh, yeah, oh I'm yeah. get some ice. It's just weird to me that there was so much skepticism every time someone tried to mainstream this as a product. Because you have to think about it. Like, they're not, because, because they're, they're not really looking at like the demand like we are. Like, we've grown up with it as part of our lives. People back then, like, they never needed it. So it's like, but I mean, well, what, it's, what need do I have of this? It's one of these products that, is, I mean, like, the, the usefulness of it is not like, obscure at all like it's like yeah it but does a common number people of fucking like, things a lot of common people and like this is no one's except for this have lacked that vision of someone who invents a product like that or comes slow, up with a product like radical that. changes are always slow to be adopted you know we kind of made fun of it but it's true i mean you know the, it's just been true in human history when something that absolutely fundamentally changes the way people work and live and what they expect 
People are, even if it's beneficial to them, are really, really sl- they're skeptical of, uh, okay, of think it. about this. Someone came up to you. I mean, this isn't like a super useful thing, but like, TJ, adopt Bitcoin. Here's Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin. There's like the guy that paid like 20,000 Bitcoins for a pizza, however much it was. <laughs> I mean, people don't well, see the value. It's got nothing, some- yeah. Yeah, back when it was worth nothing, it's a gimmick to people. And but now, I mean, like if you said, "Hey, I'll give you twenty bitcoins," people would lose their fucking mind. Oh yeah, back then, people know what it's worth. Fucking nothing. Yeah, TJ, TJ, you were offered tons of bitcoins. Right now, TJ, you think about this: if you'd accepted those bitcoins and been like, "You know what? You're right. Ten thousand bitcoins for TJ," you'd be sitting on Easy Street right now. You'd be like, "We'd be like your toadies." Like, Scotty, tell me, you uh, praised my greatness for three hours. I'm like, yes, TJ, of course. Yeah. Dude, Easy TJ would be like street. TJ would be like Job of the Hut, and we would be like, you know, what was his name, Crustelius Crust or whatever, and, <laughs> yeah. and I'd be That's that big toe. fat bitch with the with the things in the band, you know, you know, and he's fucking like <laughs> TJ, like no. Oh. Uh, anyway, to to put a cap on this, um, it actually is still nice kind of cap. a kind of a pretty big um yeah an ice cap witty one tj thanks thanks papa tj for the dad joke an ice cap <laughs> witty. i should write for the boston Gazette. <laughs> you should yeah, you should you should travel Be back perfect. to 1822 and write for the boston Gazette. slippery situation <laughs> um so uh, the ice market's still pretty big. I, I was kind of shocked to find out it's about a two point five billion dollar a year industry because people still go out and you know for parties and uh, you know get-togethers. I buy ba- probably like ten bags of ice a year. You know, on yeah, average, you guys need some ice. You know, just uh, give me a call off the show, man. Just, yeah, oh, man, if you need some ice, I, 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 I got that ice, ice hookup, dude. If you ice were dealing up. that really nice soft ice that comes in some drinks, oh, then hit me after. I mean. Yeah. After the show, oh, I'm going to give you a call, Scotty, and we're going to talk about that business. Look, that ain't cheap, Paul. Quality oh, ain't cheap. Do I look like a, somebody that's not ready to pay? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying. No ice in my drink. No <gasps> ice in my drink, Scotty. I'm hard up. I need it. I need it. Oh, we'll have a delivery sent soon. Anyway, that's the history of ice. If you liked it, let me know in the comments. Thanks for uh, watching. I'll see you next time. Bye, bye, bye. Deep fat fight. Deep fat fight. Deep fat fight.